Uh, thank you very much, and uh, it's very good to be here. Uh, you will find that I know nothing about computer architecture. Uh, I am a physicist and electrical engineer who works on hardware. And yes, I work with photons. What am I going to tell you today? I'm not going to tell you to make an optical computer. I think that's mostly a bad idea. But as has already been pointed out to you, optics is very good at communications. What I'm really going to talk about today is why we need to move over to using more optics, especially inside machines, for the communications. Primarily, I think we should move to all the interconnects off the chip, from the edge of the chip. We should think about doing those in optics, and I'm going to give you the arguments for that. And as we know, things like Denard scaling have, have ended. The specific way in which we scaled silicon chips has also ended. But the interconnection scaling actually ended a long time ago. And we have been living in a world that is like a Manhattan uh, with a complete uh, traffic jam over the whole island. We basically live in that world all the time with high performance machines. And the reasons for that are not problems of silicon. They're problems of copper. It's the difficulty of making the connections that is becoming more and more of the problem. And I do not know of any physical way out of this without going to optics, without going to more optics. And the good news is that optics offers us a few orders of magnitude of headroom, both in the energy and in the density for the connections. The challenge is the technology is not necessarily easy, but we do not need any new physics in order to do this. And that's the essence of my entire talk. I could stop at this point. I probably won't. Um, but that's what I'm going to tell you this afternoon. So, as you see, I'm at Stanford University. Uh, those of you in this room probably have seen me around. Many of you may have taken classes from me. And the title, as you see, is Saving Energy and Increasing Density in Information Processing Using Photonics. So, first of all, uh, although these slides may become available to you anyway uh, on some posting, I'm always very happy to send copies of my slides out to anyone. Just send me an email. And most of this talk is based on this paper. And uh, this is an open access paper. So if you follow that uh, DOI link uh, there, you'll be able to get a copy of this paper. And I'm also happy to send you a copy if you need it. So here's the summary of what I'm going to try to cover. I'm going to start with some background on our growth in the use of information. Now, this is something that uh, changes all the time, but there is no doubt that our growth in the use of information has been and continues to be somewhat exponential. And then I'm going to talk about some limits to that. And the limits come primarily, the ones I will talk about, from interconnect density. We cannot continue to scale the amount of information that we get on and off chips and from the energy involved in information processing. And here's something that might come as a surprise to you. Most of the energy in handling information is in communications. It's not in logic. And we're running up against limits on energy, and I'll just show you some of those. And the only way to get rid of most of that energy is to think about changing the way that we send the information around. So I'll show you that and try to give you a sense of that. And then I'll get into uh, the topics about how optics can help with that, why it could help with that, uh, to first of all eliminate the energies associated with wires, and secondly to solve the interconnect density problem. And a third one is a little surprising, it's to eliminate unnecessary circuits. And here I mean the interface circuits that run the links. How are we going to use optics to help with that? That seems an unusual thing to do. The underlying goal of this path that I'm laying out here is perhaps that we would think of doing all interconnects, not just the long distance internet, not just between racks and data centers, but all interconnects possibly from the edge of the chip using photonics and that we would transform the energy involved in doing that from something that is in the scale of one to 10 picojoules per bit that's roughly what it costs to send information from chip to chip or, or inside racks, to something that's more like 10 to 100 femtojoules per bit. So that's two orders of magnitude in reduction in that energy. And I'm also arguing that that energy is really the dominant energy in handling information. Now, 
Uh, if you're not used to these numbers, these uh, prefix, prefixes here are ones that physicists and some uh, electrical engineers work with all the time, but of course a picojoule is something that is uh, basically a trillionth of, of a joule. Get my pen to work here, get the pointer. A picojoule is about a trillionth uh, of, of a joule, and a femtojoule is a thousand times smaller than that. And you're going to see throughout this talk, I will keep talking about picojoules and femtojoules. The picojoule, as I say, is the characteristic energy, maybe one to 10 picojoules, is the characteristic energy required today to communicate a bit of information on or off a chip. And that might seem a small number to you, but it is in fact a very large number because we communicate so much information. And then I'm talking about the notion that we might be able to take two, two orders of magnitude out of that energy by cutting over to more optics. Then we get to the 10 femtojoules, 100 femtojoule range. And this is the, supposedly the total energy to handle a bit. Everything from the logic level here to the logic level over there. That's the idea. Everything, wall plug uh, energy that's involved in doing that. Okay, so uh, my other argument is if we don't do this with optics, I do not see any other way of doing it. I don't think there's any other technology sitting in the wings that will get us out of this. Not RF wireless, it won't get us out of this. Superconductors will not get, it out of, get us out of this. I don't see any other technology. So optics, as far as I understand it, is the only way we're going to uh, make substantial advances in solving these two problems. So here is a, a graph. I put this together based on a rather interesting paper. I uh, shouldn't use the laser pointer here. Interesting paper uh, from about 2011. Uh, maybe it seems a little old now, but uh, this paper looked at information very generally. It looked at storage of information. It looked at communication of information. It looked at processing of information. And that includes everything like sending newspapers on, on railway trains. It included everything uh, that was going on. And much of this is not really very surprising. I used to work for a telecommunications company, AT&T, and round about the year 2000 was the cutover. That is when the internet started to beat out all telephone communications. It became the dominant way of sending information, and it is these days the dominant way of sending information overall. And most of that information is sent over most of the distance that it travels on optical fiber. We could make many arguments as to why we have the internet today, and it's certainly true if we didn't have silicon integrated circuits, we wouldn't have the internet. But if we did not have optical fiber, we certainly would not have the internet. That's what enables us to send vast amounts of information over vast distances. And it has its same Moore's law growth in capacity like the silicon chip uh, had for its growth in its ability to uh, process information. That has been a remarkable development, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a second. One thing I would just say to you, if we put our minds to it, on one optical fiber, we could have everybody in the world talking at once and get all of that information over one optical fiber, which is the thickness of one human hair. I don't have very many of those, but that's the, that's the thickness of it. That's the level of the capacity of optical fiber. And it means that we're nowhere close to running out of space to put optical fibers in the ground. We basically have run out of space in cities to put roads, we know that. We're nowhere close to running out of space to put fibers in the ground. Where we do begin to run into a problem, even with fibers, is inside very dense information processing systems like data centers. Even there, the fibers may not quite do it, but they're still a lot better than wires. So uh, this was the cutover, as I said, round about the year 2000, and uh, the telecommunications is almost entirely the internet, and the internet is this dashed line here. And then I've also plotted on this uh, same graph a completely different thing. I've plotted the growth in our ability to, to process information based on the number of, of MIPS, millions of instructions per second, that we had manufactured and installed of general purpose uh, processing units. And on the face of it, this looks pretty good. So this blue line here, also increasing this nice big exponential uh, rise here, uh, that blue line looks as if it's parallel to the red line and everything is good. Our ability to calculate is just as good as our ability to communicate. They're growing together. Actually, that's not true. And where it completely breaks down is inside the machines. And we're basically not able to keep up. Now, these numbers here that I'm showing you, for the first decade or so of, the, of, this, uh, of this century, we were seeing 
60% per year growth in both the telecommunications bandwidth being deployed and our ability to, ability to calculate, and that corresponds to a factor of 100 in 10 years. Now, if you look at a study as to how much energy we were using to do this, it's quite a good European study down here, we're using something like 5 to 10% of all electricity to process and communicate information. Well, if you have another factor of 100 increase in the communication and processing of information, then we need 1,000% of the current electricity in order to handle it. In other words, if we do not keep reducing the total energy per bit to process and communicate information, we cannot keep scaling our information processing uh, and our use of information in the same kind of exponential scale. And in that sense, energy becomes a dominant limitation. And if you talk to somebody who builds data centers, they will tell you that they have to think an awful lot about energy. And they build their own power plants, they've got all sorts of very good cooling engineering, uh, very good electrical engineering to feed the, feed the power to the machines. So there's an energy problem with these systems. Uh, we have to do something if we're going to continue to scale our ability uh, to process and communicate information solely based on energy. And the second point is we are already at saturation in our ability to communicate the information inside the system. Thank you. This is a picture, a map, and I have to be careful here not to put up a copyrighted uh, material. This is uh, certainly public domain. Uh, this is a very, very old map, and it's a map of the first transatlantic telecommunications link. And that dates from 1865, approximately the same year as Maxwell's equations, I think. And uh, uh, I can't show the, the maps of the fiber, but the maps of the fiber around the world look rather like this, but with hundreds and hundreds of cables all over the place. Now, there's interesting stories behind this uh, submarine telegraph cable. People had already made cables, for example, from England over to France. That doesn't have to go so far. So they knew about making submarine cables. And they thought, well, we'd really like one across the Atlantic. So they had a few attempts at this, and the first several attempts failed. One of them failed in a, a rather amusing way. Uh, they couldn't get enough signal at the end of the line. So they kept, up put, kept on putting up the voltage that they put on the line until they got to two kilovolts. They were switching on and off two kilovolts to send Morse code over this, this line, and it blew up the line. And then they realized they needed to do something a bit more fundamental about it. So then they went and talked to somebody whom you will have heard of, perhaps. If you're a scientist, you've certainly heard of this person. But this person, as an engineer, figured out, first of all, he figured out the equations for propagating signals along lines. He figured that all out. And he told them they needed to use better quality copper because they were getting limited by their poor quality copper, which had too high a resistance. And he also invented the device that you put on the far end of the line so it could pick up very sensitive signals. So he did those two things. And that made the whole thing work. And that person was Lord Kelvin, the same person who gives his name to the scientific uh, temperature scale and who worked on entropy and the second law of thermodynamics and all sorts of other things. But he was also a very good engineer, and he was the person who solved this problem. Of course, when you do that, you end up with a pretty big fat cable. And here is a picture of the cable. Actually, this one on the right is the one that is for, for the, near the shore because you need a, a thicker one. It has to be more armored. But the basic point is you need a big, big fat cable in order to do this. And the reason for that is because of the resistance and capacitance of the cable. You may remember there was a thing long before Brexit, there was a thing called the British Empire. And round about the turn into the 20th century, the Brits managed to do something remarkable. They managed to get what they called a thin red line, which was a continuous telegraph system that went all the way around the world. And they did this based on signaling, basically using what uh, Kelvin had invented the strip chart recorder, uh, the siphon recorder. So a little pen like we use in seismographs today. It was invented by Lord Kelvin. And the uh, operators who ran this could read these signals. And incidentally, they had to get very good at doing it. And for those of you who are into signal processing, these operators were capable of doing deconvolution. They knew how to recognize on these signals 
uh, uh, what was going on, they can deconvolve the impulse response of the line so they could actually read more bits per second than you could deduce just from simply uh, above and below the line kind of, of signaling. They get very good at it. The longest link in that line, because the Brits had had a minor problem uh, with this place called the United States of America, and that meant they could not go from like San Francisco uh, over to uh, the other side of the Pacific, and so they had to go from uh, 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 f uh, Vancouver um, to Fanning Island. They had to go from Bamfield, Vancouver Island, actually, or down to Fanning Island, which is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And that uh, was about 4,000 miles long. And what happens when you do that is you run into the problem of the resistive capacitive time constant of the entire piece of copper. And these people were able, using their deconvolution by very skilled operators, to send the equivalent of seven bits per second. That was the capacity of that line. But you could get information down it. However, this same problem does not go away. There's a basic problem with the resistance and capacitance of electrical lines. And basically, at least unless you go to more sophisticated multi-level signaling and start building modem circuits and things like that, the bit rate you can get down this line is basically one for every RC, uh, resistive capacitive time constant of the line. And that problem does not go away. And so as we look, for example, a hypothetical line on, on a chip or something like that, and the one I've drawn here, I've just drawn a line on the right, which is you know, just some uh, conductor above a, a ground plane down here or a smaller version of it over here on the left. And the catch with this is, if you look at these two lines, if I take the line on the right and I scale it down in all three dimensions, the resistive capacitive time constant of it remains the same. And that's a basic scaling problem of electrical interconnects. And what in the end it means is if you reach the sort of RC limited capacity of these lines, and for short lines uh, they tend to be RC lines, not LC lines, if you reach that RC limited capacity, you can't get any more information through the system by shrinking it or by making it bigger. It makes no difference. There's a hard wall on information density in simple electrical connections. Now you can do things about this. You can, as I say, go to a multi-level signaling, you can go to modems, you can put in repeaters and the like. But those all have a circuit cost to them. But in general, there's a simple scaling limit. And as I say, it's a limit that is actually dimensionless. The, what's over on the right-hand side here is dimensionless. The cross-sectional area of the line divided by the square of the length is a dimensionless number. And that's what is saying that this limit is scale invariant. If you've filled all the space with wiring and you've reached the maximum information you can get through that, it doesn't get any better if you try to shrink the whole thing or try to make the whole thing bigger. You've reached a fairly steep, steep wall. Incidentally, the, the prefactor in here is about 10 to the 16, which might sound a lot, but you can check it out, and that pretty much gives you the capacity of a coaxial line or a line on a chip. Pretty much gives you the answer to that. This doesn't get any better, strangely enough, if you go to inductive capacitive lines. It actually gets slightly worse, which is maybe surprising. So the simple story is once wiring fills all space and you're running it as fast as you can get the signals down it, you've more or less had it. There's not anything you can do that substantially puts up the capacity of that. As I say, you can start doing multi-level signaling, you can start doing more sophisticated signal processing on the line, but that is putting up the circuit cost and that puts up the energy, by the way. Now, optics is good because it doesn't have this particular scaling limitation. It completely avoids it. This scaling limitation mostly comes from resistive loss. Optics doesn't have that. Incidentally, as I said, this problem is not solved by going to superconductors, however. And optics has a very small wavelength. The fact that it has a small wavelength means that you don't have to use metals to confine the radiation. You have to use metals in transmission lines to stop the radiation leaking out. The metals have to give the very difficult boundary conditions that keep the radiation inside the wire. The wavelength of light is half a micron. And that's small enough you can use dielectric waveguides, which are generally larger than the wavelength. Optical fiber is a good example. The active part of the optical fiber is about 10 microns, and the overall thing is 100 microns. So the combination of these two things means that optics doesn't have this particular scaling problem. So that scaling limit that electrical wiring runs into does not exist in optical systems. Now here's some pictures of wiring density. Uh, this is one that uh, 
uh, shows here are, the, here are the wiring layers on the top of the chip. There are these telegraph poles here. The uh, logic units are down at the bottom here. You can see some of these uh, little things down here called people. Uh, and that's taken, that picture was taken sometime towards the end of the uh, 19th century, I think, in Manhattan. That might be Broadway. Basically, what has happened here is we have filled all the available space with wiring. And it's saturated. And you can't get past that without changing technology. Now, there were a bunch of things that people did uh, back then in order to do this. They improved the signaling down the lines, but they also had to go to switching technology to uh, optimize the use of lines and so on. A bunch of things they did. But this problem does not go away. Here's the inside of a telephone exchange in the uh, early 1970s. It's filled with twisted pair. And uh, I can't show the uh, usual pictures I like to show of, uh, of wiring on chips, but to give you a sense, the fabricate, this is a supposed cross-section of a chip, it's just a sketch of it. A supposed cross-section, if you cut through a chip, nearly all the fabricated volume in a chip is wiring. It's not transistors. The transistors are so small that on a scale like this you couldn't see them. The wiring layers on the surface of a chip are something in the scale of 5 to 10 microns thick. The transistors are things that are on a scale of tens of nanometers in size. So nearly all the fabricated volume is taken up by wiring. And this basically, this, the wiring systems on chips basically uh, satisfy this limit that I've been talking about all the time. And this is some uh, data from uh, the ITRS roadmap. So those things have changed character a little recently because the, uh, the Moore's law is not continuing in the same way. But if you took a simple-minded extrapolation from like a 2007 chip, you realize that although perhaps the ability to process, which is the orange line here, might continue to grow uh, on, on some kind of Moore's Law carver, maybe it doesn't, the input-output rate certainly doesn't. You run out of pins and you don't want to clock them any faster because you've reached this particular wiring limit that I'm, that I'm talking about. And this causes what people in architecture know as a byte per flop problem. You would like to get one byte of information out of memory for every floating point operation that you were going to perform, but in general in computer architectures you can't do that. And that ratio is probably getting worse, as I understand it. All right, so let's move from the density problem, which I say can be solved by optics, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. Move from the density problem uh, to the energy problem. Here's a list of energies per bit as we look through the internet. And it took me a while to compile these numbers. It's rather difficult to nail down. But they're quite surprising in many ways. First of all, the worst of all is your cell phone. The cell phone ha uses an energy that's in the scale of microjoules to tens of microjoules per bit. Overall in the system, that's the energy that it takes to send wireless information in and out of your cell phone. It's on that scale. And that's orders of magnitude larger than any of the other scales. So one might reasonably ask if we're going to 5G and we're going to have a thousand times more bandwidth, uh, we may have a problem here with energy, and I haven't seen people discuss that in any great depth, but maybe that will come right. Now, if we look at the internet pretty quickly, we, we try to get out of wireless in the RF sense and get into optical backhaul, uh, or maybe you have a modem on, on your wall that's connected directly to an optical fiber. Uh, that, at the moment, still takes a fair amount of energy. It's some 10 watt box, and because we're not sending a very large amount of information through it at the moment, the bit rates are perhaps not yet that high, it becomes the next largest amount of energy per bit in, in the internet to send information. But the next one might begin to surprise you. You might think that the next largest energy would be the long distance communication of information. It isn't. So the wavelength division multiplex links, that's what WDM stands for, 20 hops over a wavelength division multiplex link in the internet is something that will consume a few nanojoules of energy. But more energy is dissipated inside the Cisco router. And that is energy inside the box. It's the wiring inside the box is where the energy is being dissipated. The Cisco router, or whatever manufacturer it is, that is routing the information that comes in off one optical fiber and sending it out on another. Now, as we come inside the information processing system. For example, look at this number here. The energy in the DRAM cell to store a bit of information is probably something in the scale of 10 femtojoules, 20 femtojoules. The energy to communicate to an off-chip DRAM is 5 picojoules. It's nearly three orders of magnitude larger. Now, there are many things one would do as a result. We put the memory as close to the processor as possible, and all that is, is good news.
But the energy required to fetch bits from some other chip is basically this number I've been talking about. It's the number of picojoules per bit. And I've also shown here uh, a characteristic number for communicating off chip is a, in the scale of picojoules to maybe tens of picojoules. When we look at the energy for logic operations themselves, they're not so bad. Even an entire uh, floating point operation per bit is probably only of the order of 100 femtojoules. So an entire floating point operation, 64 bit, might be 6 picojoules or something. Per bit, therefore, 100, 100 femtojoules in the calculation. And you know, running an individual CMOS gate is probably something down in the scale of a number of femtojoules. Maybe 10 femtojoules, maybe at best 100 attojoules. Arrow being a 10 to the minus 18 joules. But once we come to make a gate and connect over to the adjacent gate, the numbers tend to go up. And that's it's mostly the connection number that gets you these energies here. And communicating across a chip is the better part of a picojoule. So coming off the chip is a number of picojoules. Communicating across a chip is the order of picojoule. All of these energies are much larger than the logic energy uh, inside the chip, the transistor energy inside the chip. Let me just show you some data rates at different length scales. It's very difficult to get firm numbers in these, but I think the orders of magnitude make some sense to us. So um, one estimate by Cisco of end-to-end -end internet traffic, so that's not the stuff that sort of flows around between the data centers as well, but end user to end user, they estimated a number of about 280 terabits per second, and that's a number that I've already mentioned because that's the data rate if everyone in the world is talking on the telephone all the time. That's roughly the data rate associated with doing that. As I said, you can incidentally get all that down one fiber if everyone was at the two ends of the fiber. If you look inside a data center, it's, again, it's difficult to get numbers. In 2015, Google published a number that their rack-to-rack -rack traffic was probably in the scale of a petabit per second, so 10 to the 15 bits per second. It's probably quite a lot larger than that now. If you look inside chips, again, people don't normally publish these numbers, but I find one chip that did. Uh, the edge, edge numbers, the, the aggregate data rate that you could in principle drive off a chip by running all the pins at their maximum uh, data rate frequencies would be in the scale of terabits per second. And if you look inside the chip, the network bandwidths inside the chip are, are many terabits per second, possibly tens of terabits per second. The conclusion out of this is that though the, there's a lot of information goes over long distances, there is massively more information at short distances. A few chips could generate enough data to saturate our end-to-end -end data traffic on, on the internet. There's just massively more information at shorter distances. Um, here's an old graph that Krishna Saraswat put this one together, I think, uh, back about uh, in, in the early 2000s. Even by 2002, 50% of microprocessor power was in interconnect. And it's probably gone up since that time. That includes the clocking. System power is financially significant. Anyone who puts together data centers or, or knows this, that the cost of powering a server over its lifetime is comparable to the manufacturing cost of the server. Um, question for you, how much energy does it take to perform a Google search? So you've queued up your search searching for some kind of cat videos or something on the internet, you're ready to hit enter. How much energy are you going to dissipate in the internet when you hit enter? So I want to take bids on this. How many will bid me a millijoule? Anyone bid a millijoule? Is a millijoule going to do it? Is that what you're going to, as much as a millijoule? Are you going to use a whole millijoule to do this? 10 mil, a millijoule. All right, we have a millijoule. Will anyone raise me in a millijoule? 10 millijoules. Will anyone give me 10? 10, 100, all right. The answer is one kilojoule. Whoa, wow. And if you don't believe me, Google it. Because <laughs> that number actually comes from somebody at Google. There's real energy dissipated in the internet, and that is dissipated mostly in the data centers and thereabouts. Now, Google does a very good job at trying to make these things as efficient as possible. It's not a fault of Google that that's the answer to this question. But it's significant energy. And you know, there are pictures out there of cooling towers at data centers with steam pouring out of them. And this is perfectly, perfectly real. And if you're worried about whether you should work on interconnects or work on solar power, well, solar power is fantastic, but we're already dissipating more power in interconnects than all of the solar power generation. 
This is an environmentally significant number. Anyway, my major conclusion out of this is that though it does take more energy to send information over longer distances, there's just massively more information sent at shorter distances so that most of the energy dissipation in our handling of information is in shorter links inside machines. It could be on the chip, but the ones I'm going to talk about are about mostly going off the chip to solve some problems. And the reason for this is fairly simple, and we don't need to go through all of these numbers, but a key point is that the capacitance per unit length of all electrical lines is the same. It's about two picofarads per centimeter, give or take a factor of two or so. And that's because you remember from your electromagnetism that the capacitance of a coax line only depends logarithmically on the ratio of the inner to outer conductor sizes. Basically, when you're in lines, capacitance is only logarithmically dependent on the, the, the relative dimensions. It doesn't depend on the absolute dimensions of everything. A 50 ohm line has two picofarads per centimeter of capacitance. An 80 nanometer line on a chip has a comparable number per centimeter. So we are stuck with the capacitance of electrical lines. There's essentially nothing we can do about it. And therefore, if you had some line that was communicating, for the sake of argument, let me say a volt. I mean, nobody quite works with a volt. But if you had a one volt signal across a chip that's the order of centimeters in size, then that's where your picojoule comes from. So once you start sending electrical signals over centimeter scale distances, you start running into picojoules and tens of picojoules of energy. And that's the basic explanation for the energy dissipation in electrical interconnects. And another way of putting it is if you look at a logic gate, the wiring capacitance from maybe a little bit more than one gate's length is comparable to the capacitances inside the gate. So the logic energy, which is primarily to charge and discharge capacitances of the device itself, becomes comparable to the energy required to send the information a gate or a few gates further away. And since mostly we send the information further than that, then most of the energy dissipation is in wiring. Now, I'm not advocating we cut over to optics on the chip. The wires are still the best way to do it on the chip. But we see the problem that the energy dissipation is mostly in the communications. And if you want to get a number in your minds, again, it's the same number I've been mentioning. This is a 200 attofarads per micron or 2 picofarads per centimeter is the capacitance of wiring. And an order of magnitude number that you might think of is that every time you touch a bit in a CMOS circuit, you're probably dissipating femtojoules of energy on the average. Is it 100 femtojoules? Well, it could be if you're going a long distance. If you're really, really, really local and it's just going to the very next gate, then maybe it's less than a femtojoule. Maybe it's 100 attojoules. But in your mind, think about this number that I am going to, every time I touch a bit in some process, in some calculation, anything that I run, I'm dissipating possibly 50 joules, maybe 10 uh, of energy when I do that. And that's important because you might think I can solve all these problems so I can go to better signaling. So I don't have to put such large voltages down lines. I'll go to better signaling. Just put in some amplifiers and I'll, I'll start doing time multiplexing to get the capacity up. Well, in time multiplexing, think about how many times you touch the bit in order to time multiplex different streams. And you have to buffer it to do clock, clock and data recovery. And you're moving these bits around in the shift registers. And your multiplexers are running at very high speeds where it tends to cost more energy. The time multiplexing circuits to drive time multiplexed on information on and off lines, whether it's optical or electrical, those circuits take picojoules per bit because they have to touch the bit multiple times in the, in the whole process. And the receiver amplifiers you might put in there to work with smaller signaling levels, those things take picojoules per bit to run in practice. So there's a real difficulty in getting past the picojoule per bit level. Charging the wire is taking as picojoules per bit, running the circuits that might be amplifiers or running the clock and data recovery, running any time multiplexing so we're getting the bandwidth up. Every one of those is taking energies that are of the order of picojoules. And that's why it's very hard, therefore, to get past this, this number. So my argument is that the dominant energy dissipation is probably charging and discharging wires inside machines. It's not long distance. It's not the logic. It's the charging and discharging wires. <laughs> So how can we get around that? Well, I don't want to bore you with too much optics, but I'll run through this, these arguments um, uh, reasonably quickly here. 
So one way to get around the charging and discharging the lines is to stop using lines. And if we go to optics, there's a very neat trick in optics. And the bottom line in optics is you don't have to charge the line. You just have to charge the photodetector. And I'll explain that. It's sometimes called quantum impedance conversion. It's actually a piece of quantum mechanics. It's actually the very first piece of quantum mechanics. It's the photoelectric effect discovered by Heinrich Hertz, same Hertz, in, I think 1885. So maybe we should stop doing that. And the key trick for that is, as I said, and we don't need to look at all the details here, when you work with a light beam, you're not measuring the classical voltage in the electromagnetic wave. You're counting the photons. And that means that fundamentally you can do an effective impedance conversion. So the, the electromagnetic wave going in free space, we can we view it classically if we like. For example, take a one nanowatt light beam for the sake of a calculation. The classical voltage in that with an impedance of free space of 377 ohms is about 600 microvolts. But if I take a one nanowatt light beam and shine it into a photodetector and suppose that I can put something like a one gigohm load on it, the one nanowatt light beam would generate of the order of a nanoamp, which basically means I could drive the diode into forward bias or, or change the voltage across it by some good fraction of a volt. I'm not measuring the classical voltage in the beam. And that's one key reason why optics can ultimately save us energy and connections. We, we don't need to be working with large classical voltages in the electromagnetic wave. It doesn't need to be the logic level voltage. It doesn't even have to have a voltage, by the way. It's a separate issue. But the key now is that we have to keep the capacitance of this entire system low enough that it's worth it. So if the capacitance of this system is picofarads, then forget it, because we're going to have to charge picofarads to a volt, and we're not any ahead of the game. We're back to picojoules again. So a key point is, if the optoelectronics is going to help with this energy problem, then we have to have very low capacitances in the optoelectronics. Oh, and the optoelectronic devices need to be efficient. However, we do have fairly efficient devices in the lab, and we do have low energy devices in the lab. We don't have to invent fundamentally new devices here. So we have to reduce the energy in optoelectronic devices. And so that the energy to send and receive the optical signal is not greater than the energy it would have had to have used to charge the wire in the first place. And, and that's one reason why I'm not pushing to put this stuff as on-chip connections. That's the hardest comparison, because the wires are shortest, and wires still work pretty well on-chip. But once you get off-chip, you're trying to deal with this picojoule or tens of picojoule number. So as people who work, as engineers who work on optoelectronic devices, we want to push the operating energies of the optoelectronic devices down to, say, 10 femtojoules or something like that, or sub-10 femtojoules. But actually, we can do that. Uh, it's kind of hard with lasers, but we can make pretty good modulators that do that. And we also want to make sure we're not blowing the whole thing on the capacitance of the wire that connects the photodetector to the receiver or to the logic circuit. We have to keep that really short so the capacitance of that wire isn't too much. And that means we have to integrate. And that's where the technological challenge comes. We have to work with optoelectronic devices on the transmitter end that are probably different from what we've been using in the past. We can't just use the long distance telecommunications lasers. We have to go to some other technologies. But these are all demonstrated in the lab. We demonstrated some here. And we need to do a pretty good job at integration. Basically, if we don't want to incur more than a femtofarad of additional capacitance, our photodetector has to be within 5 microns of the transistor to which it's connected, because we have 200 attofarads per micron of capacitance in electrical wiring. And that means the photodetector has to be right on top of the chip. Or ideally, in beside the transistors. That's harder to do. It'd be good enough if the photodetector is right on top of the chip, on top of the wiring layer, and you've got 5 microns to get down to the transistors. That's about a femtofarad capacitance, and that, that, that would work. So let me just give you some orders of magnitude on capacitance numbers. A conventional telecommunications photodetector might have a picofarad of capacitance. Why? Because the capacitance of one cubic micron of semiconductor is about 100 attofarads. And if you have 100 by 100 micron photodetector, then that's a picofarad, because you've got 100 by 100 cubes of 100 attofarad capacitance. However, if you put the detectors, make them small, 5 micron detectors, these were done in CMOS a while ago, 4 femtofarads, 
That's not useful to us because CMOS silicon does not absorb at the wavelengths where we want to do most of our connections, which are mostly in the infrared. But as a detector, it works just fine. Here's our wiring capacitance again. FET input capacitances are things that are intrinsically in the scale of tens to maybe hundreds of attofarads. So that's comparable to these numbers. And as I say, 100 attofarads for a cubic micron is a good number to keep in your head. But what this means is, if we're to get to the capacitance numbers we're looking at, and the capacitance numbers we're looking for at the receiver end in particular, are of the order of a femtofarad total, we need micron scale devices. They don't have to be deeply, deeply submicron. Micron scale devices, photodetectors, and within microns of the transistors. So this is not a ridiculous thing to ask of integration technologies, but it still means you have to generate an integration technology to get to it. Uh, here's uh, a modulator device that uh, Jim Harris's group, uh, with some collaborations with me, had made a few years ago. This is the best optical output device on silicon, in my humble opinion. Uh, this, uh, for purposes of persuading the contract monitors, you can sell this thing as being below a femtojoule. More honestly, it's about seven femtojoules when you include everything else you might have to throw in. But this is without uh, you know, really trying, it's without really uh, going down to uh, very small scales that one could use. Uh, and so the idea of a 10 femtojoule device on silicon, integrated with silicon, is perfectly real, at least in a laboratory demonstration sense. And you can talk about doing some other things. So some talk about doing nanometallics, or sometimes called plasmonics. And that's an interesting thing, it, but essentially this is doing RF circuits at optical frequencies. So you can make coplanar strip lines in optics with an 80 nanometer gap, those actually work. But you can only go about 10 microns in those, they're pretty lossy. You can make Hertz dipole antennas, and this is a Hertz dipole antenna uh, that we made in collaboration, and this is using a technique that Jim Plummer had come up with. I see Jim sitting over there. Uh, growing germanium on silicon, so we used Jim's technique, grew some germanium on silicon. Uh, this is, none of this was done by me. Uh, germanium and silicon, and then we turned that into a tiny little photodetector with a Hertz dipole antenna connected to it to funnel the light into the little germanium photodetector, and that actually works. And this is us zooming in on the chip here. Uh, here is the line of germanium using Jim's technique grown on the surface of the chip from a seed uh, point here. And then on top of that, you make a tiny little Hertz dipole antenna. Here are the arms of the antenna. And this is the, the, the feed gap of the antenna. These, are, these don't matter much for the antenna, strangely enough. Uh, you can actually make that thing, and we did that a few years ago. You can use nanometallic techniques in order to concentrate the light even further, and that might be an interesting future direction. Though interestingly enough, you don't even have to do that to get to the numbers I'm thinking about. So there's a bit more headroom there if you get really exotic. And these antennas do actually benefit the performance of the detector, even though they're a bit lossy. So these things are about 130 nanometers long, and they're pretty much Hertz dipole antennas. Now, this is where I go completely off the map. And I go into uh, an idea that people will think is ridiculous. We figured out then how to make the optoelectronic devices. In principle, we, somebody is going to do a good job in the integration technology, and we're going to put these things on top of the chip. And those devices are going to run with femtofarad capacitances and they're going to run with 10 femtojoules of energy. That we can actually see how to do. But remember, there are all these other energies involved in driving a link. So if we do this conventionally, we end up with a receiver amplifier in front of the photodetector. That dissipates energy. The best ones I've seen of, of amplifiers are down in the hundreds of femtojoules per bit level. That's still way too much. And even worse, are things like time multiplexing circuits. And I mentioned this before. But if you decide you have to go to time multiplexing circuits to put more information into the same link, whether it's optical or electrical, you end up dissipating a lot of energy to do that. And you also need, uh, so that's this serialization, deserialization, you need to recover the clock phase uh, from most links. Uh, and you also may have to do clock distribution. And those things are blowing your whole budget. Those things are taking picojoules of energy. So is there any way to get past those? And this is where what I'm talking about gets ridiculous. And to people who are used to the normal electronic world, this would be very scary and close to insane, what I'm going to propose now. So bear with me. <laughs> 
Well, the first thing we can do is we can get rid of the receiver amplifier. We don't need to have a receiver amplifier in our optical link. The kind of energy we're going to get at the, uh, of our optical link, at the end of our optical link, is perhaps going to be about a femtojoule of optical energy. That's of the order of 10,000 photons or so. It's quite a lot of photons, so we don't get into statistics of photons, Poissonian statistics of photons, that doesn't come up. It's, it's quite a lot of photons. To people in telecommunications, that's actually quite a lot of photons. If you put that into a conventional photodetector, this is back to the integration question, if you put it into a conventional one picofarad photodetector, then those 1,000 photons, they give you 1,000 electrons, 10,000 photons, they give you 10,000 electrons, they have to discharge the capacitance of the photodetector. If it's a one picofarad photodetector, then you get one millivolt out of that. It's not good enough. If you go to a simple integration technology like solder bump bonding, the capacitance involved there is probably about 30 femtofarads or something like that. That gets you 33 millivolts signal. Again, you're going to need to build a receiver amplifier. But if you get to one femtofarad total capacitance on the front end, then you can generate basically a logic swing. So it's possible to get rid of the receiver amplifier and get rid of those hundreds of femtojoules to picojoules of energy per bit. And that's good news. So we can probably do that. That's not the insane bit here. Uh, and as I said, you, you know, you could propose integrating this. This is the most extreme version I've shown here, where I've put the, the photo detectors right beside the FinFET. You know, this is, this is a very extreme. And actually, in this case, I'm actually bringing light in, and I'm using nanometallic concentration to feed these things into you know, sub-100 nanometer scale things. That's the most exotic, but you don't actually have to do that. Uh, if you put the photo detectors just on top of the metal layer, it may, may be good enough. So the photo detector thing is, is not the insane bit. But the insane bit is this one. So I want to get rid of time multiplexing. And I want to get rid of clock and data recovery. Because those operations are taking me picojoules for every bit I'm sending on and off the chip. Could I possibly do that? Well, you cannot do it with wires. And you cannot do it with wires because the time delay on wires is not predictable. And the reason why the time delay in wires is not predictable, the scale of a clock cycle, is because of the temperature coefficient of the resi resistivity of copper. So the signal coming down the line, first of all, it broadens out from a nice sharp pulse to a very squidgy kind of thing because of the dispersion on the electrical line. And if you have a variability in the resistivity of copper, then the slope of this rising edge changes with temperature. And that means you cannot find a decision point in here whose timing is precise. Optics doesn't have the pulse dispersion, and optics also doesn't have the temperature coefficient uh, of the delay that is nearly as bad as this. In optics, over, say, 100 degree temperature variation, the time delay over 10 meters of optical fiber varies by only of order 10 picoseconds. And in free space, you don't get much uh, temperature variation at all in the, in the signal delay. So optics could give you calculable signal delays. And if you're only talking about some small fraction of a clock cycle, which is what we, in the slot we allow anyway in logic circuits, then you only need to get the, the lengths of the optical paths right within centimeters. And we could construct a company tomorrow that would sell you optical fibers that were cut to precisions of a centimeter. That's not hard to do. That's a pretty easy job to do. So we're contemplating a system here in which when you build the system, you actually fix all of the delays in the system. And you fix them to integer numbers of clock cycles. Then you never have to do clock phase recovery on the system. And it's pretty easy in optics to distribute the clock frequency. And that's not a hard thing to do. And optics could do that with short pulses so that you get very precise timing. So that's part of it. But I'm also going to throw away time multiplexing. If I throw away time multiplexing, I don't have enough lines. If I'm not going to run at 100 gigabits per second on these lines, these 1,000 or 100 lines, how am I going to get enough information going around the system? Well, that's where we get to another degree of freedom we have not yet exploited in optics. Free space. So your rods and cones in here have a few million pixels uh, in them. And you can image this room with a fairly simple piece of optics. You actually have millions of channels uh, coming into your, your eyes. Optics has lots of spatial degrees of freedom. And so the insane idea is, let's run everything at the chip clock frequency 
and just choose lots and lots and lots of free space optical channels. And then we don't have to do time multiplexing. Now that's a radical idea, and most people who are used to electronic systems find this extremely scary. I'm just going to have a thousand channels flowing through free space, a hundred thousand channels flowing through free, free space. How am I going to sort those things out? Again, it's called lens. Optics actually works, and we were systems made in the 1990s in research that worked with the 65,000 light beams, and the things work just fine. Now, this is radical, but it's not that hard to do in optics. We've been able to work with arrays of light beams in optics. It's fairly easy to generate large arrays of um, light beams in optics and use things called diffractive optics generators. We can work with large arrays of optical beams. And that would mean we did not have to do time multiplexing. And that would get rid of these other picojoules of energy. And if we really want to get rid of those final picojoules of energy associated with the time multiplexing, then this is one degree of freedom we've not, not used yet. So let me give you a little bit of optical physics here. Uh, the number of channels that you can have limited by diffraction between two surfaces of areas, you know, well, AT and AR, transmit area, receive area, is a rather simple formula, and this is the diffraction limit. It's the product of the two areas divided by the square of the distance between them and divided by the square of the wavelength. And what does that mean? It means if I'm looking over to Jim there, sitting, he's about 10 meters away from me, and Jim holds a telephoto lens up, a normal camera telephoto lens, and I hold a normal camera telephoto lens up. We have approximately one million channels. That piece of optics, limited by diffraction, will handle a million channels. It's not even that hard to make the lenses that do that. It's nothing like the, you know, the 64 million pixels that you're routinely playing about with or something like this. These are astonishing pieces of free space optics, by the way. Just astonishing pieces of design, but because you make so many of them and you can charge a lot for them, you can do a really good job in the optics in here. This is free space optics with I don't know how many tens of millions of pixels now inside here. We know how to do optics. So that's one concept, and if we come down to a shorter scale, suppose we're going to communicate between two chips. Well, that's not nearly as much area. We might only want to work with a few square millimeters of area on the chips to generate the arrays of light beams, and we might want to put them centimeters apart. How many channels can we do then? The answer is of the order of tens of thousands of channels. So millimeters of square millimeters of area and centimeters of separation, like going chip to chip, could handle uh, uh, thousands or tens of thousands of channels. And that's where you get the degrees of freedom. So this, as I said, seems fairly insane. Uh, we can draw out the optical systems. As I say, these optical systems have been made in the lab uh, many times, back especially in the 90s and on the early 2000s, and then they were kind of literally put on the shelf. But these are the kinds of systems. Uh, this idea here and going from one chip over to another chip, this is not a waveguide in between. It's just a piece of solid plastic or glass uh, just for mechanical rigidity. So that, that's, that's the concept here. This is where we get the other degrees of freedom in order to stop ourselves having to time multiplex. And this is the part that is close to insane to most people, but not to optics people. Optics people look at this and say, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, we can do that. And doing something like this is more a question of deciding you want to engineer it and setting up the team to do it. This is not like generating the next generation of silicon technology. It's much easier than that. And just to think about it for a minute, as I say, it's quite easy to generate very large arrays of light beams, tens of thousands. It's not that hard. We've been doing it for over 30 years. It's not that hard to line up an array of light beams. It's not like aligning 10,000 beams. It's aligning one beam where you also have to deal with an angle. So the whole array, you have to get the rotation angle of the whole array right, and you have to get the dilation of the whole array right. So there's another couple of degrees of freedom. I think we can do that. And if you want to think about a servoed optical system that works to submicron for less than a dollar, uh, take apart, you remember these things called CD players? Well, take those things apart. That's a spinning disk, and this thing remains active alignment. It's servoed, but it can do it, uh, submicron alignment. We could make this optics. It's a matter of just deciding to do it. And free space arrays actually obey something called Fermat's principle, and that means that all the path lengths are actually equal in free space uh, imaging at least if you do it right. So hypothetically then, we would have some array of, uh, these are called grading couplers. They would send light beams in and out of the surface of the chip. Here's a hypothetical one, 10 by 10 micron optical pads. 
uh, millimeters uh, of area that can handle um, of the order of a thousand channels. And uh, I'll show you a bigger picture of this uh, here. But here's a straw man uh, architecture. So what I would do is I would take my chip as usual, and you're seeing the cross section of the chip here. We'll just go to the next one, it's a bigger picture. You see the cross section of the chip here, I already showed you something like this. In fact, I had stolen this diagram to make the one I showed earlier. Here's the cross section of the wiring layer of the chip. On top of that wiring layer, I put a photonics layer. So this is silicon photonics, the so silicon waveguides. This is a technology that exists and is used quite a lot now, silicon photonics. That is waveguides. I could put my modulators in there. I think I would have to add better modulators. I'd have to do something like the ones I was showing you, which would take a bit of technological effort. Possibly I can put the photodetectors up here, or maybe I can put the photodetectors down beside the transistors, as in, as in this picture here. So the notion, this is a straw man. It's a silicon chip, and on top of that chip, I put a photonics layer. And in that photonics layer, I put a bunch of waveguides. I possibly put photodetectors. I think I'll put modulators up in there to turn on and off uh, light beams. And then as I come up to the larger size scales here, I imagine that I'm going to collect these various uh, couplers into two-dimensional arrays like this and send these arrays on and off the chip with the kind of optics that I've been, been talking about here. And I may also be generating arrays of light beams to send onto the chip somewhere else. And incidentally, I can also bring off fibers here if I want to. This is a straw man. It would take some technological effort. But this straw man, without inventing anything new, I can reasonably argue if I engineered it fairly well, I can hit 10 femtojoules per bit total energy. That, that's my argument. And I think the physics works. I don't say the technology is all there, but it doesn't require that we invent anything new in order to do it. So there is two orders of magnitude of headroom sitting there for us in the energy, and I believe also in, in the density. As I say, we do need some technology stepping back a little bit here. Um, some of my colleagues here, Yelena Vukovic, works on some very cute nanophotonic devices, and we kind of need some of those because we need to make better beam couplers. So one of the hidden problems in optics is making good beam couplers. And you might think this is straightforward. I take all this light here, I put it into a piece of glass. It's not all a piece of glass, I've coupled it. No you have to get the beam shape right as well. So it's not just a question of having the loss in the glass or the waveguides low enough. You actually have to match the beam shape because you're coupling into a mode. And getting that so that the loss of those couplers is down at percents rather than decibels is actually a very tricky task. And that's one of the things that optics needs to work on. And it's been needing to work on that for 40 years, by the way. But nanophotonic techniques, exploiting ability of silicon technology to make you know, uh, structures down in the 100 nanometer scale is actually coming up with some interesting ideas in there. So I'm claiming on my straw man here, I think I can see how one can engineer, without getting really extreme, I could engineer a 10 femtojoule per bit system, as opposed to the picojoule per bit systems we're looking at. And that, that's my core argument, really. All right, I think we're getting to the end here and running out of time. So just let me throw up a few conclusions on this, what you may well regard fairly as a speculative talk. But I think I've tried to illustrate that information processing is being limited by density of connections and by energy of connections. That these are major issues. They have almost nothing to do with the silicon transistor technology. That's not the problem in this aspect of this way of looking at systems. And I argue that optics can help solve both of these problems and that there's a couple of orders of magnitude of headroom in here for them to do that. But it would need some technological work and we would, in the end, have to start thinking physically about the systems in somewhat different ways. Uh, and that's definitely, uh, definitely challenging. And my goal, as I said, is to try to get the thing, the whole system down to something on the scale of 10 to 100 femtojoules per bit instead of 1 to 10 picojoules per bit for the off-chip connections. That's the argument. The challenges here are uh, ones of integration of the technology. We need very low capacitance integration. We need low loss coupling. Uh, a good piece of news out of that is if you work on these problems, then people, I think, will pay for them anyway. Because people would love, for example, of low loss couplers. It helps all kinds of optical systems, including rather conventional uh, fiber-based systems. That would be a good thing. Uh, I think the integration of photodetectors and the like and the generation of low energy optoelectronic devices, those are all things that we want anyway. A radical step would be whether we cut over to that free space optics, 
but I think it would take less money to generate this whole infrastructure than it would take to generate the next level, the next generation of silicon integrated circuit technology. I think it would cost less than that, I don't know. And there's some radical steps involved here, especially if we go to this, uh, this kind of free space system. Um, do we go to synchronous systems? I claim that I think we could actually do that. And then it becomes a question of how much we are prepared to invest and how soon we're prepared to invest it. And that's a non-trivial issue and I don't want to oversell this. I'm really selling a good news message. There's two hours of magnitude of headroom here, guys, in the interconnect density and in the energy. And it's a question of how soon we're going to make that, that change. But the good news is that those orders of magnitude of headroom are sitting there and we don't have to invent anything fundamentally new to get to them. And with that, I will stop and take any questions. Thank you very much.